The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. In the year 2000, Ben Heckendorn built his first mod. We can rebuild it. Smaller. Better. Portable. Since then, he has continued his work, helping those in need with creative new projects. Got an idea you'd like to see built? Why not send it to the Ben Heck Show? Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. If you're anything like me, you probably have piles and piles of pop cans or soda cans, depending on where you live, laying all over your house. What can be done to stop the madness? When will it end? Well, the human race is in luck because today's viewer challenge comes from the Longhorn Engineer who writes, Hey, Ben Heck, this is the Longhorn Engineer, aka Recarp, from your forums. Can you build an awesome automatic can crusher? I'd even come up to help. It could be solenoid powered and even have a readout of how many cans you've crushed. Could this end the world's soda can crisis once and for all? I should contact this guy and see what he's thinking with the solenoid powered idea. Longhorn Engineer on screen. So what's this solenoid idea you told me about? Basically make a big solenoid like in a pinball machine and then it would crush a can. Hmm, can you draw what you're thinking of? Yeah, let's see if you can have something like that. Something like that, so you have your solenoid right here. Right. And then you fire, and then hit the can right there. Oh, okay. Can you tell us the theory behind the solenoid? Basically, it's just a whole bunch of water, and then uh, that's wrapped around a, a coil, and then uh, once you apply current through it, it induces a magnetic field into this rod here, a metal rod, that shoots the rod through. Okay, well, uh, why don't you come on up here to Wisconsin and we will put this thing together. Okay. See you next Wednesday. Hey Ben, what's going on? Oh, Parker. You made it up from Texas. Yes, I did. Okay, did you bring the stuff? Stuff's right here. All right, let's take a look. Ah, looks good. All right, let's build this automatic can crusher. Step right in. Thank you, Ben. All right, I'll just leave that there for now. Uh, Parker, can you explain what you're doing here? All right, this is our test solenoid setup that I've been working on for the past couple weeks. So we got a coil there wire. We have our bank of capacitors and our rectifier to turn the uh, AC voltage into DC voltage. Basically, I'm gonna touch this wire on that wire, and this rod's gonna shoot through and crumple the can. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> Parker, what happened in here? It's like super dark. Find the breakers, Ben? Yeah, here they are. Uh, let there be light. Sure that's gonna work? Good, we can get it hot enough. We gotta cool this thing down fast. <sighs> okay, well for our next test, we've mounted the solenoid into a very high-tech bracket, as you can see. It's actually kind of similar to how a pinball solenoid is uh, mounted. Parker, prepare for test two. Test two. So we have the solenoid mounted, the can with the hole in it, and the uh, rod set up. So we're gonna put this over it to hopefully contain any Shrapnel that flies out. Fire! Oh, we're getting there. Yeah. Much better than the first attempt. That Pepsi can has seen a hard life. Okay, well we used the test solenoid and it kind of did its job, but we needed to do its job better. So now we're going to make a new solenoid that's even longer and more deadly. The goal here is to make the new solenoid the same thickness as the old one, but longer in length. We hope this will give the crushing rod more momentum and power. You measure the diameter of the old coil and then make marks on the new tube so we know when to stop winding. So how's it going over there, Parker? Uh, it's doing okay. Yeah, it's uh, fun, I guess. You know, by the time we get this thing finished winding, there'll probably be a new size of pop can and it won't fit. Yes. And we'll be like, no. Or it'll probably just be made of plastic by then. Though. Probably. Well, here's the old solenoid. Uh, it was wound uh, poorly. <laughs> okay, you said it, not me. Here's the new one we just wound while watching Mystery Science Theater 3000. 
Uh, as you remember, we made the marks to figure out how thick to wind it, but we're going to see, before we attach another length of wire to it, we're going to see how well it works with just this much wire. So here we go. Okay, ready? Yeah. Close your eyes. Oh! oh that sounded good. Okay, day two. Now, as you may remember, we made marks on the coil here to figure out how thick we had to wind it. And now we've wound it all the way. We had to actually link the wire at one point. But we're ready for the test to see if we can actually get the um, plunger to pull in far enough to crush the can. On, charge, fire. All right, let's take a look. Hmm, didn't really crush that much more. Maybe it's time to think about a mechanical solution. Yeah, I think that's the way to do it now. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's just not feasible in terms of how much power it takes in controlling it. Some things were better left beyond human hands. Yes. Now let's take a break from the viewer challenge and work on the Xbox 360 laptop some more. If you've been watching the last few episodes, you know that we're taking an Xbox 360 game console and turning it into a portable laptop form. On today's episode, we're going to be routing out the parts to make the case and then putting it together. All right, well now we're gonna route out the uh, curved lid tops for the Xbox 360 laptops. Oh, well, actually no, they're the bottoms. Well, they're curved. And we're gonna use this curved bit to do it. See the nice three quarter inch there? But uh, the problem is, the material is three quarter inch, but the bit's actually longer than that. So C would dig into the table past its edge. So to solve that problem, we're going to use some cheap sacrificial foam, tape it to the material you want to cut. That way, when the bit cuts all the way down, it just eats into the sacrificial foam, and the table will be safe. You can see the bit went down into the blue sacrificial foam, giving us a great, nice curve around each of the pieces. So yeah, sometimes it's worth it to like, you know, waste two dollars worth of insulation foam in order to um, cut the material the way you like it. So now we need to cut out the insides of those pieces. So we line up three of them on a sheet again, and this time we're going to use a two by four inch piece of the sacrificial foam, and we're going to use it as a jig. So what we do is we cut out this shape here inside the jig so we have a place to stick the blank piece. Then when we stick them all in, they're held in place by the vacuum and the retention of the foam around it. Then we can carve out the insides. Okay, as you can see here, we've grouped all of the walls into one sheet of uh, two foot by two foot. And uh, even though splitting the walls up into pieces makes it easier to cut more of them, it's still kind of a chore to place them all on the board because not only do you have to place them, but you have to make sure that you can get the bit around them, which you can do by doing an outline. So as you can see, it should fit. The big CNC machine is great for cutting out large things, but for smaller, more intricate parts, it's best to use a laser cutter or a laser engraver. I use one to do the um, detailed sections on the units such as the ring of light, the buttons, and the vent holes. As you can see, it cuts out pretty nicely and it's almost like magic. But now comes the lame part, sanding. Who knew Bill Paxton could be so much fun? Parker! What's going on, Ben? I, this game looks awesome, but I've got some fun stuff for us to do. And more fun than Paxton? It's even more fun than this pinball game. Come on! Good. This isn't fun at all! Keep complaining, I'm not gonna let you whitewash the fence later. So these pieces came off the router, but as you can see, they're, you know, not perfect, so... Even though we've used a computer to route these, there's still a lot of hand labor required to make them look nice. Yeah, we've got most of the pieces uh, ready to go, don't we? Yeah, it's almost done. Alright, cool, we can start putting it together now. Okay, so now we got the pieces all sanded, which was totally fun, wasn't it, Parker? Almost as fun as wrapping that solenoid. So we're going to use the drawings here to piece together the um, parts of the plastic. Okay, so that's the bottom half of it. Then we have the thing that holds the screen. And it goes uh, right here. Then we have the screen lid. And there's a depression here to allow the circuitry at the back of the screen to fit. This part's actually kind of heavy because there's a lot of mass left to it, but that's alright. Makes it more sturdier. Again, here's the USB access. 
these holes here, uh, this one's just an extra vent, you can never have enough vents, and this one actually allows you to remove the hard drive, so that's what that's all about. And then the back, we have the power plug, and this is where the cord comes up for the HDMI connection. If you had the case come apart like this, like this was the bottom and there was a layer up here that came apart, you would need to screw about this long for it to work, and it would cost a lot more than these little half-inch screws. That's why I put the separation down here. Oh, it's a stormy day outside. Okay, well now I'm going to glue these pieces together. And the big thing is to try to get it as flush as possible. But also, I want to make sure the glue is going to stick, so I'm going to rough this up a little bit. I love super glue. Super glue is so awesome, but sometimes it sticks to flesh really easily. The reason it does is because super glue is actually activated by water. So um, when it comes to contact with water, such as skin, and you know, you're made out of water, that's why it sticks so fast. All right, well now we're going to attach these laser cut plates to the piece. So see how that goes right there? These line up and it creates the main face of the unit. That was fun, and don't worry, my finger survived. In the next episode, we'll start putting electronics into the case. We now return to our regularly scheduled can crushing project. Okay, we're back. Now we're going to try a mechanical solution to get the cans to crush. So as you can see here, I've got a little rig going. I've got a off-the-shelf can crusher. I've got a cord. I've got a stepper motor right here. And it has a timing belt that goes up to this larger thing here. So this will give us a three to one reduction for more torque. And then the lever on this, being 11 inches long, gives us even more torque. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to run the sever motor a little bit at a time using a microcontroller, like we discussed in the last episode. It'll run about 75% uh, of a revolution, pulling this cord a little bit at a time so we can control it. So we're going to power up the stepper motor driver, and when I push reset on this microprocessor, it's going to start to pull the pulley, so let's watch it go. There we go. Okay, it was very rough, but as you can see, we proved that a stepper motor can crush a can. So now what we're going to have to do is look at this rig and figure out how we'd actually build the can crusher around it using this theory of operation. All right, we're here with math expert Jason Jones. How's it going? And uh, he's going to help me figure out this gear ratio thing so we can at least get a theory of operation of how to get the can crusher to work, even if we're not going to have enough time to finish it on this episode. So we've got a stepper motor there, and then we have a larger pulley, and we've got the belt. And the belt's a lot cheaper than two big gears. So this, gets, this one has three times as many teeth as this one. So that gives us a three to one reduction. All right, all right, does that make sense? You're a car guy, you should know all about this. Kind of. You need to get a stick shift. What's wrong with you? I don't know. I'm lazy when it comes to driving. <laughs> it's like breathing after a while. You don't even think about it. So the stepper motor drives this, which gives us, you know, this gearing reduction. And then it has the can crusher over here, which is pulled from this position to this position. And this distance here is 11 inches, right? All right. So if that's a radius, the whole circle of that, if this was a gear, 22. 22. If we built another machine that did the same thing, like, if we had a piston here and a big gear here that was driven by the stepper motor, what is this reduction? What does this have to be? Three to one is the difference between this and this. Yeah. But this thing, the um, diameter of it is basically two. So wouldn't that be oh, 11 I to see, one? I see what you're saying. From okay. this to this? Yep, so it'd be 33 then. So. Okay, so yep. we need 33 to one. You confuse me with your engineering. A worm gear. Awesome. Yeah. So how does that work? We have this, and then the worm gear is up here, which is kind of like this thread of rad that just happens to be on the floor. Mm, convenient. Picture that, and it's driven by a motor here. Worm gears have very high reduction ratios, so it's very easy to find one like 30 to 1. Okay. So you do 30 revolutions here before this even does one revolution, oh, right? Oh, all right. So what you could do is drive this directly. Right, like that. Or you could have a gearing on that. But basically, the worm gear here, this turns and it rotates this, this way. So then what you could do is you could make kind of like a, a piston chamber, like this, kind of like a locomotive, 
okay. or Locomotive Breath, your favorite song. So this turns and it goes and turns around. So when it turns, this goes. Okay. Get it? Yep. Crushing the can here. Uh, However, I'm not sure how fast it might would be. It might not be that fast. But it would be a much smaller size. Oh yeah, it'd be for that. It would be smaller than this even. I mean, remember the ultimate goal is to make something that you can fit on the wall. But oh yeah. Probably between two. What is it? You redid your basement. What is it? 18 inches between beams? Something like that, right? Roughly, yeah. Yeah, I just use a stud finder. Well, come to think of it, when we did the CNC machine episode, we realized it took about 10 revolutions of the stepper motor to drive the machine one inch. So to have a 30 to one worm gear, we would have to do 30 revolutions to make the worm gear rotate once. So. We'd be looking at roughly one can crushed every three seconds, which really wouldn't be that fast. So now I post it to you, the viewers. Do you have any good suggestions? Should we try some servo motors? Do you have any kinds of servo motors we could try? Can you suggest something? I want to hear from you. Well, the can crusher didn't work out quite as well as I'd hoped, but at least we got the Xbox 360 laptop case built and it's coming along. Be sure to tune in next time as we build a portal costume for Halloween, see-through shirt, woo, based off the hit game. We'll see you then. The Ben Heck Show is made possible by our sponsors at Element 14. For more information on all my projects and for a list of all the parts I use today, visit element14.com. Visit their community in the Ben Heck Show group using the URL below. Join me there to get more details about a chance to win the Xbox 360 laptop we're building. We'll see you next time.